Hello and welcome to episode 20 of Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez, your hostess for this next hour of UFO shenanigans, where we look and think outside the proverbial box, jump down rabbit holes, and where the red pill is actually a red tic tac. If you haven't had your paradigm shifted, get ready. Joining us today is Mr. John Russell. He is a psychic, psychic reader, a medium, a certified tarot master, a paranormal investigator, and a now published author. Internationally known, he has provided psychic readings for clients in over 40 countries. Without further ado, let's bring in our extra special guest, Mr. John Russell. How are you doing, John? Ah, oh, Christine, I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me so much. We're going to have a blast tonight. This is going to be a lot of fun. Well, like I was telling you off air, I mean, you're just a different kettle of fish altogether. You're like the whole exactly. package. <laughs> <laughs> not not only are you like a, a UFO enthusiast, but you also have a spiritual background. You even, right. and we're going to get into some other things on other parts of your background as well. And then you're also sure. a psychic. So you're getting all of these little bits and pieces, putting it together all in one body, body and that's you. That's me. And I'm an ordained minister, and not the degree mill kind, but a legitimately ordained minister. I was a, an associate pastor of a small church for a short period of time. So I have all the, the philosophical, the religious, the spiritual, the psychic, the paranormal, all the background. <laughs> and we're actually going to get into that specifically, hopefully, today. Because I, I read that, and I'm thinking, all, yeah. I need to stop you on that, John. We have to get into that. Absolutely. But <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a little bit later. Akashi, sure. Chris, oh my gosh, thank you so much for the super sticker. I want to say hi to everyone in the live chat. Alien Girl, Jim, Paul, Backwoods Buster, how are all of y'all doing? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here, guys. Appreciate it so much. So, Russell, for my younger audience, how would you define a psychic? Well, a legitimate psychic is someone that is able to see into people's past, present, and future. Uh, you can tell what's happened to them in the past. You can tell what's going on in their lives right now. Uh, you can read their emotions, what they're thinking, uh, get insights into uh, the people and personalities and circumstances, environment that's around them. And you can tell them with accuracy, literally, what's going to happen in their future. And the way you prepare them for that is if it's something negative, you tell them how to minimize it, hopefully avoid it entirely. If it's something positive coming, then you want to tell them how to position themselves to be able to take advantage of that and interact with it when it comes. So short answer, that's what a psychic does. And what's the difference between a psychic and a medium? In your words, well, you know, not not really a lot. I mean, people tend to segregate things and they shouldn't. If you're a psychic, you should be a medium. If you're a medium, you should be a psychic. Uh, a medium uh, primarily concerns themselves with contact with people on the other side, beings on the other side, deceased loved ones. But people, I, I begin to notice when I was, uh, I started doing paranormal investigation, paranormal research when I was about age 12. And I begin to notice that people segregated themselves. I'm a psychic, but I'm not a medium. I'm a medium, but I'm not a psychic. I do this, but I don't do that. And the, uh, the approach that I took growing up was I explored and learned and experimented with everything. I didn't put any kind of restrictions on myself. And I said, okay, uh, if I want to communicate with the other side, I can do that. If I want to be a psychic and use those particular skill sets, I can do that. If I want to learn psychometry, I can do that. If I want to learn remote viewing, which all true psychics have always done, we just put a new age label on it now, clairvoyance, clear seeing. Uh, so I, I didn't put any, any restrictions on myself and I don't think people should. Uh, it's the same way as people, you know, psychics that go, well, I can read for other people, but I can't read for myself. Yeah, you can. You just don't want to hear what's coming. You know, it's like we're, we all don't want to hear the truth. Right. <laughs> and so some of the psychics are the worst. They're like, oh, uh, you know, yeah, I could read for myself, but then I'll have to have to listen to what I know that is the voice of truth. And I may not want to head that direction. So uh, I think that we should be open to all spiritual gifts and practice them all and not limit ourselves. And I just want to preface that 
and like I said at the very beginning, you know, I have a lot of young subscribers. So sure. many, many of which who haven't really been exposed to these kinds of topics, at least in depth. And of course, you know, I'm learning myself too. So some of these questions might seem kind of basic for some, but I think it's great to to <laughs> really get the all clear on the paranormal pi um, paradigm because there are so many facets to it and it's it's hard to know all of it. It is. It is hard to know all of it. It's it's very um, uh, it's a it's a shotgun approach. I mean, there's so many things to look at. But if you have a lot of experience, a lot of years experience, you begin to find out that things kind of basically clump into a very few categories. And, uh, you know, like, um, for example, channeling, that's the new age word for a spirit. Uh, you know, speaking through you. Well, spirit mediums have always done that. And the spiritualist movement going way back, that was a feature of that. So if you start getting back to the roots of things, and if you start finding out, um, you know, for example, the, the spiritual energy of key, for example, and then various cultures call it different things, but it's just that, it's the life force. And if you take away all the labels from every, every culture, from every religion, from every teaching, you can find these common denominators. You can find these roots that go back to things. And people call it by a lot of different labels, but it's just that one thing. And once you learn that, that simplifies things and helps you to figure out, oh, okay, well, this is that. And this is how you learn that. And this is what you do with it. So it simplifies things a lot. I, I have to agree with you on that. When it comes to labels, it just makes everything muddy. It makes everything really complicated. But when you just kind of pull them out and you're yep. like, yeah, just a plain slate, I agree. It does make a things a lot more simplistic. Absolutely. I <laughs> I want to say thank you so much, Kelly. She says, great work, great interview. I appreciate oh, it so you. much. And Christopher Plain brings up astral projection. Yeah. Is, is it something that you do? Is it, is it common among psychics? Um, what are your thoughts on astral projection? Well, astral projection is a real thing. Uh, it's simply where you project, and here's where the argument gets, gets tedious. Is it your soul actually leaving your body and joined by the silver thread? Is it your spirit leaving your body? Is it your consciousness leaving your body? Are you not leaving your body at all? You're simply projecting part of your consciousness to a place and receiving that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, just astral projection is real. You can project. Uh, you can uh, send your consciousness elsewhere, however that vehicle occurs. And like I say, there's a lot of a lot of uh, you know argument as to what it actually is, but it is a real thing, and it's simply projecting your consciousness to a place. It's like what remote viewers do. You know, remote viewers are given a coordinate and they project their consciousness or their mind or whatever there, and they're usually in a semi-conscious state, maybe a semi-trance state when they do that, because they're focusing and they're concentrating on sending, uh, you know, their, their consciousness there and picking up what's around, seeing what's there. But I say a semi-trans state or semi-conscious state because they also then have to make notes or draw what they're seeing. So they're not like, you know, totally completely out of it. But uh, uh, good recommendation to the topic of, of astral projection. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'm trying to remember the author's name, Phillips and Denning or something like that. Uh, the, they wrote some good introductions to that. Go to Llewellyn.com. Llewellyn has been a, a handler of all types of psychic books, mystical books, and, and that type of thing since forever and a day. And just enter astral projection there. And they ha have a ton of good books on the topic and you can start learning from there. So there's a lot of different approaches to it, but that's the basics of it. And Chris also asks, what reading material would you recommend as a good introduction to the topic? I guess not just astral projection, but also the paranormal and um, psychic reading. You know, I tell you, there's there's a lot of nonsense out there. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't work. Uh, there's a lot of things written by people that think they know something and they don't. They've uh, uh, talked to somebody who talked to somebody who knew somebody, and, and then they accept that as gospel. One of the best books... Uh, on the planet that I can recommend, and it's out of print, but Amazon always has it in its certified resellers. So if you just go to Amazon, enter the title in the search box, it'll come up through the resellers and you can get it there. Now, the problem with it being out of print is that you can get a signed first edition for $500 
uh, you can get a paperback for 1095, you know, whatever. So you have to look, you just have to keep looking till you say, okay, I can justify spending this amount of money for it. But the title of the book is uh, David St. Clair's Lessons in Instant ESP. Now, the title is a misnomer. It's not an ESP course. What most people don't know, and as an author, I know this, a, a lot of times when you send in a book to a publisher, the editor will change the title of the book. And that must have been what happened here because this is not an ESP course. For example, Gone with the Wind was originally titled Tomorrow's Another Day. So uh, a lot of times titles change from the from the editors. And uh, this book, uh, David St. Clair's Lessons in Instant ESP, is a, a complete course in psychic development. And it's practical because what David did, he's, he's long gone now, but he roamed the earth and he interviewed psychics and mediums and spiritualist and everything everywhere uh, of every practice in every country of every stripe of religion and, and psychic belief and paranormal belief. And he found out that there were certain things that worked. And so he stripped all the religious dogma and all the association away from that and just said, here's the technique. Here's how to learn it. Here's how to do it. And this will work for you. And it's one of the best books in that regard I've ever seen. It's practical. It works. There's some things in it that I use today. Uh, still use because it's it's practical and it works. So that's that's a good place to start. It's a practical place to start. It actually works if you put it into practice, and it'll it'll leave you it'll give you some good uh, good results. Laura asks, "Do you believe there is a significant neurological link between psychic ability and trauma?" Uh, that sometimes happened with people. My, there was no trauma with me. There was no physical trauma or illness or anything like that. Uh, but some people have never had, to their knowledge, any type of psychic or paranormal experience or anything. And then they're in a, a really bad car accident and they get a really bad head injury. And in the hospital, all of a sudden, their aunt walks in and they go, oh, you've just been to see Uncle Charlie's grave and put flowers on the grave. And How did you know that? And so they become psychic as a result of the of the injury or the trauma. So that does happen, but it's it's not necessarily... Um, that for everyone, um, it can develop in many different ways. Some people it develops after lengthy periods of meditation. Some people are just born with it. Like I was, uh, some people it occurs after trauma. So there's no one cut and dried way that it develops. Laura, thank you so much for your super chat. It was a really interesting question that I yeah, haven't heard of question. before. Yeah. Thank you. So you said you were born being psychic. Is that right. correct? Right. So did you kind of like grow into it like a pair of new shoes or was it just like you knew exactly what was going on from the beginning? No, I didn't know. It was, um, and the way it developed, um, I had this, um, awakening, this, uh, this old black ghost came to me, this old black man <laughs> who came to me and, uh, Oh, hold on to that because we'll talk about that. Um, this old black ghost woke me up when I was about age five in the middle of the night uh, my parents had left a nightlight on down the hallway. So if I had to get up and go to the restroom or whatever I could see. And I suddenly woke up out of the sound sleep and I couldn't figure out why. And I raised up on my elbows and I looked around my bedroom, didn't see anything. And I looked out my doorway into the hallway and from around one of the doorways in the hall, down the hallway, this old black gentleman was peering around the doorway, looking at me and I screamed bloody murder because obviously I'm white. Uh, we didn't have anyone black living with us. I don't think my family even knew anyone black at the time. So my assumption as a five-year-old kid, somebody's broken into the house. I don't know this person. And when I screamed, he walked around the doorway into the hall and started walking toward my bedroom with his eyes locked on me. And I can he was absolutely physically as solid as you or I. He wasn't wispy. He wasn't transparent or translucent. He was every bit as solid as you or I had clothes on. He had close cropped white hair, a white mustache. He had on a red flannel shirt, khaki pants, black shoes, black belt. And I screamed bloody murder again. And as I did, then he became translucent, became transparent and vanished right before my parents ran into the bedroom. And they tried to tell me, oh, you just, you watched something on uh, TV that scared you and you had a nightmare. And I knew better. I knew that I had seen someone and then it dawned on me, oh my God, I've seen my first ghost. <laughs> and he came for one purpose only 
And I discerned that later, and that was to awaken my psychic gift and to open this portal to the other side so that I would have these experiences with the unseen dimension. And I've had since then well over a thousand physical paranormal manifestations. And when I say physical, these aren't things I meditate or dream or envision or hallucinate. These are things that literally actually occur on the physical realm. We've audio recorded them. We've video recorded them. We've taken pictures of them and other witnesses have experienced them and seen them as well. And these are things that interact with the physical realm, appear physically, uh, make physical noises, appear on tape, uh, video, audio, physically. So uh, that was his purpose. And, and doing that was to awaken that and to create that portal for me. And that helps me to begin to understand the other side and what's going on, what works, what doesn't. And then when I was between about five and six, uh, the psychic component came in when I was out playing in the backyard one day and this car pulled into the driveway I didn't recognize. So I went and ran inside and I said, hey, mom, dad, there's somebody out here. I don't know who it is. So they came out and, oh, these are friends of ours. I said, okay, I'd never met them before. So they were standing outside talking and I was goofing around with a toy playing and kind of eavesdropping. And all of a sudden I looked at these people and I said, you guys just went on vacation. And they stopped and everybody got quiet and looked at me. And I said, you took that car, you drove the car that's in the driveway. And I said, you took two kids with you. They're not with you today, but you have two kids and you took them with you on vacation. And you stayed at this hotel that had this many stories and was this color and looked like this in the front. And it had these trees in a row in the front that um, uh, looked like this. And the pool area is this color in the back with these chairs and looks like this. And the guy was just kind of grinning funny, like looking at my parents back and forth. But his wife, literally her jaw was agape and her eyes were bugged out. And she was staring at me like I had cobras coming out of my head. And she looked at my parents and she goes, how the hell could he possibly know that? And my parents kind of stammered and, well, my, you know, kids imaginations. And she goes, kids imaginations. How the hell could he possibly know that? That's what we were coming to tell you. We just took this vac vacation and that's what we were coming to tell you about. We took that car. We took our kids. The place we stayed is exactly like John described. How the hell could he possibly know that? And of course, my parents are stammering and stuttering and like, go play, John. I was like, okay, nice to meet you folks. And I ran off and I guess I was a spooky little bastard from hell because they <laughs> never came back to visit my parents again. So that was when I discovered that I could read people's minds. I could foretell the future. I'd see where they've been. I knew what was going on in their lives. And so from there, I decided, okay, let's get good with this thing. How do you develop this? How do you get accurate with it? And in that process... Uh, I studied everything on the planet I could, psychology, parapsychology, religion, spirituality, magic, everything, and uh, found out there's a lot of baloney, a lot of phoniness out there, a lot of con artists, a lot of things that just don't work, and so why do you hold on to them if they don't work? And my, my thing was always, let's find the truth. If the truth destroys my belief system, so much the better, then I adapt to the truth. And let's find out what works and then try and make it as good as we can, get better with it as we can. And I've read professionally for 50 years now and studied since I was age 12, all these years. And I'm still learning, uh, still a lot I don't know, wish I did know. Uh, you don't ever master anything. I hate the word master. Nobody masters anything. Uh, there's always more to learn that you can always get better. You can always understand more. Uh, so that's how that all came about and, and brought me to the point that I'm at now. I, that story is insane. It, it is. really it's is. Funny. And it's it, really great. It, I mean, it's awesome. But at the same time, you know, it's so hard to believe like what yeah. a crazy story. And yeah. there are so many bits and pieces that you touched on that like, I want to talk to you about. So maybe sure. this show might go a little bit longer than oh, usual fine. because I'm, you, I'm yours. I'm yours as long as you need me. Yes. And, and we'll make sure we get the super chats too. There's some good questions. There. Yeah, there are some great questions. I mean, people are really interested in this topic. So Zofa, thank you so much. They say loving the show. Does Mr. Russell think psychic ability is a natural evolution of the human species or a gift from a non-human intelligence alien? Maybe. Uh, no, I think it's a natural part of humanity. I think it's a natural gift that resides in all of us to one degree or the other. Everybody's psychic to a degree. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the uh, 
I can study music for five years and maybe I play chopsticks real good. And that's as good as I get. You know, somebody else studies for five years and they can go on stage and make us weep with the majesty of their playing. So just like everybody has different degrees of talent and different things, so does everybody have different levels of psychic ability and it trains to a different point, a, a plateau uh, in each person. And you'll hit that plateau and then that's probably as far as you'll go. So you know, I, I've I been think very fortunate that I haven't hit mine yet. Uh, I, I think Russell Targ said something kind of similar in those lines, but I'm not too sure. But he is someone I think really fascinating to research and see his work into for those that might not know sure. him. Uh, I enjoy his work. John, I've talked, to, uh, I've talked to some people. I have a friend that was at Stanford when they developed the Stanford Research Institute, and he knew Targ and Putoff and Geller and all of these people, and he's told me some amazing things. So that was pretty good. I yeah. bet. Yeah. I bet. That's so awesome. Um, totally off topic, but I saw that Targ recently just made an iPhone app to increase your ESP uh, abilities. Mm -hmm. Well, on a phone, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we're going to get into that. Right. <laughs> John has a question. Again, thank you so much. And it says, Mr. Russell, you and I, hold on, let me zoom in. You and I seem to agree on almost everything. And we've been talking in the live chat. Do you think the government will ever admit that the public can make contact with the non-human through telepathy, or do you think that would cause public chaos? I don't think it would cause public chaos. Uh, getting the government to admit that it's possible uh, is going to be the, uh, the real difficulty because we have to keep the pressure on at this point. Um, it's like the, um, the congressman from Tennessee said, on the, uh, the, the big phone home, he said, look, this was basically kind of an error on the government's part. This is kind of a chink in their armor. And even though the uh, public report was basically about four pages, but once you got through the, the intro and the, all this stuff, uh, nonetheless, it did con contain some bombshells, one of which was their physical objects. And they're picked up on all these multiple sensors. So the congressman said, and I agree with him 100%, and that's what I've been saying all along. He said, what you have to understand now is that there's a chink in the armor and we've got to force that open. And he said, we can't be patient. We can't wait. We've got to keep the pressure on. We've got to put it on even harder. And he said, if we don't, they're going to fix that chink. It's going to slam shut. And then five years down the road, we're going to be where we are right now. So I'm telling everybody, look, the, the time for patience is way over. You know, I hear people say, well, you know, we've got this and maybe the government will give us another goodie next year. And maybe in four, we ain't got four years. Come on. This is drug on for, for just a ridiculous amount of time. And we have to go to our congressmen, our senators, to everyone. We have to go to the science, military, everybody in force together, unified and say, hey, enough of this nonsense. Now, do I think the revelation of any kind uh, is going to upset the apple cart and, you know, turn the world upside down? No, I don't. Because for one, we're better than that. It's like I saw somebody made a statement on Twitter today, which is so true. They said, look, we've lived under the threat of instant nuclear annihilation for all these years, you know, which is true. And we go about our daily business, right? And we live under the threat of all these plagues and, and this and that and genocide and volcanoes and oh, no, 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 no. We're a pretty resilient species in that regard. And as far as people being frightened to death of, of the UFO revelation, most of us have been sitting on our hands forever going, duh, we're waiting. You know, we know it's here. We've had the experiences. We see the science. We see the credible researchers saying, hey, there's plenty of physical evidence. The late Stanton Friedman, to uh, paraphrase him, once said there was a, an embarrassment of riches of physical evidence that UFOs have visited the planet. So I think most of us know that. I don't think that it's going to create a mass hysteria. Uh, I've always said in all my interviews that, uh, you know, if, the, if one were to land on the White House lawn tomorrow, uh, some good old boys from West Texas, and I can say this because I'm a good old boy from West Texas, are going to be loading up the shotguns and going, yeah, let's go get us some aliens. And then the Christians are going to be coming, forming a ring around the UFO going, Jesus, save these aliens. You know, so we're going to have those spectrums of response. And, uh, you know, basically, I think most people are going to adopt a wait and see attitude, which is what we should do. And uh, we don't know that that 
when they finally reveal themselves to us, we don't know that they're going to tell us the truth. We don't know what their intentions are. We don't know if they're going to lie, mislead us. We don't know if they're going to have some kind of misrepresented, uh, misrepresented idea of the universe and how it is or whatever. And I wish people would get this idea out of their heads that just because they're so far technologically advanced doesn't mean they're any smarter than we are necessarily. Look, a guy can be an ace mechanic and he can build a car from parts from the ground up. And he may not have enough sense to add two plus two and make it be four. He's an ace mechanic, but, you know, his intelligence may be subpar in other areas of life. So just because these guys can make a whiz bang thing that flies around the universe, breaking all known noise laws of physics, doesn't mean that they're necessarily smarter than we are, more empathetic, more moral, more spiritual, or anything else. That's a really interesting point that I haven't heard before. Oh, I like it. Jack has... To Jack. Jack has been up here a couple of times now, so let me get to this real quick. Uh, the CIA remote viewing program, I mean, it's well established that that, that was a fact. Uh, it's, it's been admitted by, by uh, honest factions of our government that it existed. It was a fact. Uh, it was successful. Uh, it did work. And uh, I've got, again, my friend that was at uh, Stanford when SRI was um, active there. Uh, he encountered some of the evidence uh, from the remote viewing program. And I have to tell you something that he told me, and it will blow your mind. It just it blew my hair back, and I'm still just freaked out by it. Um, I'm also an artist and a photographer. So when he found out I was a photographer, he said, oh, okay, you'll get this analogy. You'll understand it. Uh, when he was at Stanford and he said the CIA just like just poured buckets of money into SRI. And he said uh, they did a, um, a remote viewing test and the guy uh, accurately sketched where the subject was sitting on this bench that was by railroad tracks and then some buildings around and this and the other and so on and so forth. So he was privy to the guy talking about this out there at SRI. And he was looking at the sketch and the guy said, well, look, we got a success here. We got to hit this. This is what we need. And uh, my friend went, where's the train? And the guy said, what? And he said, where's the train? He said, if this guy is sitting out here and this train runs on a regular schedule, like a commuter train, there's got to be a train coming by every little bit. And the remote viewer didn't pick it up. Why not? Where's the train? And the guy said, well, that's irrelevant. Look, we got our target. We got where the guy was at. We got what we needed. And he said, but wait, listen, he said, suppose that your remote viewer is a film camera set on slow speed with slow speed film. And one of the things you learn as a photographer is if you're in a busy Manhattan intersection during the day, and you want to take a picture of a building, but you don't want any cars, you don't want any people in it. How do you accomplish that? You use a slow shutter speed and slow film and the people walking through just disappear, just vanish. So all you see is the building. You don't see the people and you don't see the cars. So he said, look, maybe your remote viewer is like this camera. It's a slow shutter speed and a slow film and the, the train's going by, but he's not picking it up. It's blurring. He said, what if there were a way to train the uh, the remote viewers to be a high speed camera with high speed film and capture more of what they're seeing maybe in real time and maybe motion and activity in the scene that they're at think about that look at the rich detail you can get that you're missing and the guy went yeah irrelevant we got our we got our target we're good we're gone and i was like <laughs> you know it was just so brilliant what he said and i thought this is the typical response, the hidebound response that most people give you in the realm of religion, spirit, uh, science, uh, UFOs, anything else. It's like, man, we got what we need. And, and they're not willing to investigate or to acknowledge that there could be a better way of doing it or maybe a, a more successful way of doing it. Uh, so that was that was the thing he told me and it just blew me away. I was like, holy cow. And he's so he's so right. He's so correct, you know. And I, it, would I get like, it would be like telling me if I successfully healed someone and I have, and, and maybe we can talk about that in, in a little while, but it would be like telling me, Hey, look, I can guarantee you five times more success in helping people physically and then healing them. If you'll do this, well, I've healed people. I don't need that. 
you know, you, you can't have that response. You got to examine it. So, okay, really? Well, l- let's go. Let's try it. Let's get better. So there's that. I, I think for a lot of people, they just want the answer and don't want to know the process. And I think the process is where all the magic is. The answer is just the answer. The answer is the product. Yeah, the answer is the product. And, uh, and, and you have to do a lot of work to get there. And you have to be willing to find out what works during that process to get to that sum. Absolutely. And, you know, I think um, I quickly want to mention, because we're already at the 30 minute mark, that we're going to go into a very short intermission. So I'm going to play it right now and then we will continue asking questions. And I want to say everyone in the live chat, you guys are having really fantastic questions. I'm putting mine all aside because honestly, like your questions are on fire today. So we're going to get to them and I'm here as long as you need me. All right, let's take a short break. I'm Micah Hanks, and let me tell you something. I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber, and here's why you should too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation, and all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina, become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. So the first video, I actually made that for John for his business. And that was honestly so much fun to make. So um, if you want, please support this channel. I have new shows coming up very soon. One called Strange Paradigms. And all your support really helps me do what I do, especially as a college student. So um, I thought that was fun, a little bit different. I got to play something that I've that I've made for you. Uh, thank you for that. That was so great. It, it was so beautiful and I just love it. And I've, I've got it up on my website, it plays on my website and it's just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Let's jump back into the questions. And I, I really wanted to address Christopher Plain. You know, he's had, I, I see he's like all kind of fired up for this, but he's asking, is there a type of meditation technique that you would recommend? Yeah, there is. And it's really simple. It's really easy to do. It's really easy to learn. Um, a lot of people, it, you know, I'm 67, so I've been around the block a few times. When I was You're growing good. up, I was in elementary school, and we learned to do the colors of the rainbow by an acronym, which was a man's name, Roy G. Biv. 
red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So that's how you remember the colors of the rainbow. And this is not original with me. Again, it's, this is from that book, actually, um, David St. Clair's Lessons in Infinite ESP. Uh, the, uh, the meditation that he teaches in there is as you just take some deep breaths, close your eyes, and you visualize in your mind's eye anything that will allow you to see or imagine the color red, red lipstick, a red apple, a red stop sign, a fire truck, whatever. And when you see that image clearly, then you let it go. Just relax a little bit. Then you go down to the next color, orange. Could be an orange, you know, whatever enables you to see the color orange. Hold that clearly, then relax, let it go. You go all the way down through the colors to the bottom. When you get there, you imagine yourself surrounded by this violet mist and you breathe it in and you just relax and you just um, stay in it for as long as you want to. And then you reverse the order of the colors, come back up through them and come out. Now, this is a very relaxing meditation. Uh, you can use it for any one of a number of purposes. If you're trying to seek higher insight or develop your intuition or whatever, or if you just want to relax. And I tell people, do not do this while you're driving, because a lot of people, if you're tired, especially, it's going to put you to sleep. So this is good for people that have insomnia. They wake up, they can't go back to sleep, do this meditation. And you may find out that you fall asleep before you even reach the color yellow. You know, it's like, boom, you're out. And that's good. It's done its purpose then. So whenever you use this meditation, be somewhere that you're going to be okay if you do fall asleep. And uh, it's, it's very restorative and very relaxing. But that's a very simple meditation to do that anybody can use anywhere. Like I said, that easy to learn, that easy to do. And the more you practice it, of course, like anything else, the better results you'll get. I think that's awesome. And I'm definitely going to try that now because I said people that don't sleep. Well, yeah, I will be I will be on top of that tonight. Yeah. Give that a try. Give that a try. Curious George also has a question and it's a burning question. It says, does opening your mind to this modality attract negative energies and how do you deal with it? No, it doesn't. Um, you know, the uh, I, I get really tired of the people that they find a demon behind every bush or everything's a negative experience or everything's bad or whatever. You know, I've been a paranormal investigator since I was 12. And of all the experiences I've had, now look, I'm not saying there's not evil. Of course there's evil. There's evil in the world. And by extrapolation, we can logically assume that there has to be negativity or evil or something in the spiritual realm or from here to there to the spiritual realm. I'm sure Hitler didn't go over and just immediately become a ah, nice guy. Um, but as far as encountering that and having to deal with that, I haven't. I, I don't find that. I go into these places to do paranormal investigations. I don't find these negative energies. I'm not attacked by negative energies. I don't have negative things around me. I've had uh, a retinue of guardian angels, spirit guides, whatever you want to call them, ever since I was young that I affectionately called the guys. I refer to them as the guys. And they've protected me. They have literally, physically saved my life several times. Uh, they have guided me, watched over me, protected me. And I think we all have that if we'll tap into that and tune into that. But no, I, I don't uh, attract anything negative or evil or worrisome. Uh, I don't have to, uh, you know, battle that off or, or anything like that. I do, um, you know, I surround myself with positivity. And one of the ways you can do that is if you visualize yourself in this bubble of white light, this intense glowing white light that you can't even see outside of the bubble, it's that bright. And if you do that, that cleanses your aura, that cleanses your body, that cleanses your environment. And you can do that, those types of things to keep you safe. But what really disgusts me, let me give you two examples. You know, people talk about exorcisms. Oh man, there was this, this little lady and it took like six big guys to hold her down. Guess what? I worked when I was very young for a very short period of time while I was going to school. I worked for a state school and they had people that using the nomenclature back then, they had dual diagnosis, which was mental retardation and mental illness. And we had a lot of guys that were uh, young and nuts, crazy, psycho. I mean, like they would see uh, visions of people that told them to do things, you know, some of those things were go attack this person or that type of thing. So to prepare for that, with it being a state school, 
we had to be able to restrain these people humanely without harm to them or to ourselves. And so we were taught these techniques. And then in this class, learning these techniques, um, one of the things that we had to do was we each had to take turns acting out and going into a fit and having other people restrain us with these state approved holds. So in doing that, we discovered, and we even had a handicapped guy in there that worked. He was crippled. He was really gimped up. And with him on the floor, guess how many people it took to hold him down when he was thrashing around with all his might? Five or six people. A uh, little small gal, you know, lay down there and really go for it with all your might? Five or six people. So that's not any evidence of demon possession, okay? Everybody does that. If you're really struggling with all your might, I mean, look at the videos that you see constantly now on, on the uh, the internet. Some lady, little small thin ladies out there in some hallway somewhere raising cane and going nuts and the cops come to get her and it takes three, four or five cops to hold this little woman down. Okay. That's not demon possession. That's just normal strength. That's the way we are. So that's nonsense. Um, the other thing is people misconstrue things. When I was shooting uh, the pilot for the, uh, the history channel, uh, we were at this place and this lady came over to me and she said, I've got to talk to you when, when you have a break in filming, I've got to talk to you. This ghost tried to kill me. And I was like, Oh, good God, here we go. So <laughs> this lady says, this ghost tried to kill me. I said, no ghost tried to kill you. Yes. Yes. She said, I was in my kitchen and from across the cupboard, from across the, the kitchen, the cupboard door flies open and this dish flies out of the cupboard across the room and hits the wall right by me and shatters. This ghost tried to kill me. So no, the ghost didn't try and kill you. The ghost trying to get your attention. I said, look at it this way. If you've got a kid and you go shopping, you got a boy and you take this kid and you're going dress shopping and the boy's like, Oh God, where's an ice pick I can stick in my eye. And he's wanting to get your attention. He's like, Hey mom, mom, Hey mom, mom, mama, mama. And you're not paying a bit of attention because you're looking at this dress on sale and thinking how good you can look in it. And he looks around and he goes, here's a chair. And he pushes the chair over, bam. And you turn around, what are you doing? What? The? Now he's got your attention, right? So same thing with the other side. They have these subtle ways that they try and communicate to us and try and get through to us. And what do we do? We got the earbuds in, we're bopping to the music. We're driving down the street. We're on the cell phone. We're, we're totally plugged in all the time and we're tuned out. And we don't hear what the other side is trying to communicate with us in subtle ways. And finally, if it's important enough to them and to us, they get frustrated and they go, ignore this. Here comes a plate across the room and breaks. Now I got your attention. And I told her, I said, that's all it is. And then I explained to her how to interact with it from the moment. I said, they've been trying to get your attention for a long time. You're just not paying attention. By God, they got it now, didn't they? <laughs> so, you know, we misconstrue a lot of things as something being evil or dangerous or this or that when it's absolutely not. And then you tell, you know, you have all these circumstances where, oh, this ghost pushed me down the stairs or it scratched me or it did this or it did that. A lot of people scratch themselves in their sleep, don't realize they did it. Uh, a lot of people experience things that I think are products of their imagination. Uh, I've been on a bajillion paranormal investigations. I've never been scratched, bitten, punched. Yet I've, I've been touched, uh, but I've also had my guardian angels literally save my life and literally keep me from falling physically catch me and, uh, and things like that. So none of, none of those negative experiences like that. No, I guess in the end, it's all about perspective and, and how our brains react to it, because only then can we try to assume what happened or create stories, even if right, they're real right, or exactly. not real. Well, uh, and we do that from the basis of how we're raised. If we're raised in the Christian environment, if it happens outside of the church, it's of the devil, it's demonic, it's satanic, it's evil, it's scary. If you have some other perspective, it's somebody stuck here that's coming to harm you or haunt you or whatever. So we have these different perspectives that we grow up with. And those are the glasses that we have on that we evaluate all these things as they happen. And we have to take those glasses off and say, what's really happening here? Well, I guess for many people just don't know any better. Right. Exactly. I would love to say hi to the undead gaucho. So good to see you, brother. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to say hi. Um, so you mentioned in one of your episodes on your YouTube channel called John Russell, 
you talk about that there are a lot of frauds and con men out there claiming to be psychic. How do you fish them out? What makes a real one from a fake one? Number one, money. If they're charging you an outrageous amount for a reading, con artist. If they promise you or guarantee you any type of results, con artist. If they see negativity, evil, sickness, curses around you, con artist. <laughs> because they're going to offer to get rid of it for tens of thousands of dollars, that type of thing. You say, I wouldn't be that stupid. The smarter you are, sometimes the easier it is to fool you. And you say, okay, I wouldn't fall prey to this particular con. Well, no, but these people are expert at finding your hot buttons and you might fall prey to a different type of con. And that's what these people do. So you have to look for those things. And if somebody is charging you outrageous amounts of money, they're promising things. I'm going to bring your boyfriend back. He's going to love you forever. You're going to get this job that you want. I guarantee you, you'll have a new car next month. Um, I see evil around you. Have you been feeling sick? Have you been feeling bad? Oh, there's, there's evil forces around you. We have to combat that and get rid of that. Any of that stuff is BS, nonsense, phony. Run from it. Don't deal with it. Don't patronize it. Don't fear it because these people don't have any power. They don't have any skills. They don't have any. All of these people are con artists, phonies, and frauds. And some people say, well, I went to this one and, and this miraculous physical thing happened. Yeah, it's called sleight of hand magic. You can go to any good library, find the book, find out how it's done. But if you don't know how it's done, it looks like something real paranormal is happening. But that's what these people do. And that's how they take advantage of you. And I've had to rescue people constantly over the decades. And people call me and say, John, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got two degrees. I, I own my own business. You know, I'm, and I'm into this phony psychic for tens of thousands of dollars. You know, how did I get there? What happened? What? And then you have to tell these people, okay, here's why they got you. And here's how to, you know, how to extricate yourself from that. And it's, it's really sad because a lot of these people are fearful, even when they realize they've been taken advantage of that. But, but what if there's something there, you know, and it's like, and I get away from this person, then no, no evil's going to befall you. So it's, it's a really, slippery slope. It's something I've had a lot of experience with and rescued a lot of people from, and it's ongoing. Uh, it's in the UFO community. It's in the psychic community, in the paranormal community, the religious community. Think about all the phony preachers out there. I mean, Jim Baker went to prison and people were sending Jim Baker money in prison after he was proven to be this phony and this fraud. And uh, it just, oh man, this, this stuff goes so far back. And most people don't realize the depth of this stuff. And, you know, we live in this very narrow perspective of our generation and our experience. And people don't realize how far back this stuff goes and how much it's been repeated and how much people have had to deal with it and how, how dangerous it is and how many people have been defrauded over the years by this stuff. There's nothing new here with any of this. This goes way, way back. But if you don't study it, you're not familiar with it and you don't understand it. Um, it's just like when you and I were talking about, uh, let's, let's put her name out there, Anjali big name in the UFO community right now. Well, my main problem here, besides the fact that, uh, you know, this, they're going to appear, they're going to talk to everybody and here, and here they are. Well, where are they? It's been a while now. They're, they haven't showed up. Hello. So that's another indication of somebody promises you something and doesn't deliver. Okay. Eh, phony fraud. But, uh, this is where the experience comes in and having studied all this for so long, way back when Jane Roberts came out with a Seth book, Seth Speaks. And uh, the highly evolved, super intelligent being that was Seth, that channeled himself through Jane, had these marvelous, insightful, fantastic, I'm here, but you're not here, but I'm here with you. And I see you, but you don't see me because I'm there, but I'm not here, but I am here. And it, 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 just jab my ice pick in my eyes, will you? Stupid, ignorant, ridiculous garbage that absolutely means nothing, helps nobody, accomplishes nothing, does nothing. And then here we have Anjali go to her Twitter feed and what's on her Twitter feed? Well, you're here, 
and I'm here, but we're not here. We're there, but we're not there. We're here. I'm like, my God, again and again and again and again with this nonsense. So you have this stupid, look, if these higher beings, if they're that evolved and that advanced, if that's all they can give me after all of these years over and over and over again, that does absolutely nothing, heals nobody, helps nobody, doesn't advance world peace, all of these, oh, we're entering the age of Aquarius, oh, we're entering enlightenment, oh, we're becoming this, we're becoming that. No, we're not. We got plagues out the wazoo. We got wars out the wazoo. We got volcanic eruptions. We got earthquakes. We got hurricanes. We got tornadoes. Look, we got people starving on the streets in America. Come on. We're not doing any grand, great thing here. We're not receiving any grand, great advice that is helping us on a national scale. And in all of this stuff, you get the, well, I'm here, but you're not here, but you're there. And I see you, but you know, and all of this ignorant nonsense, you don't one single time get, Hey, guess what guys go over here to St. Jude hospital where the little kids got cancer and do this. And you're going to heal them and get them out of there. Not one time do we get that. Well, that's pretty grandiose, John. Okay. Let's take it down a whole bunch of notches. How do I make more money and how do I get a better job? Well, well, can't help you there. You're here. I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, bunch of mealy mouth nonsense. It doesn't do any good. Listen, I got this thing on my shoulders. It's killing me. I've been to every doctor on the planet. Is there any way to heal this? Well, you're here. I'm there. You're here. I'm there. Nonsense. Idiotic nonsense. If these beings can't give anybody anything, anything helpful and constructive that actually does something good, and don't talk to me about, well, you got to look at the spiritual side. No, you don't. If I go to the grocery store and I say, hey, man, I'm John Russell. I've read from people in 40 countries. I've been a psychic for 50 years. I've been on TV. I've been on radio for 14 years. I've been on podcasts, 50 podcasts this year alone. I've done all these things. I've got client testimonials on my website that tell me all my predictions are accurate, come true for them, everything else. They're going to look at me in the grocery store and they're going to go, Wow. That's amazing. That's great. 222.87 for your groceries. So look, you know, you can't just get into the spiritual side of it. We got to eat. We got to pay our bills. We got to pay for the flat on the car. We got to get the new hot water heater. So there has to be a practicality to all of this. There has to be a balance to all of this. And that's what absolutely torques me in all of this idiotic nonsense is it gets off in this foo-foo stuff that you uh, that has no practical application proves nothing does nothing physical helps nobody and it just it chaps me no end regardless of where it comes from and you kind of mentioned spirituality and you also used to be an ordained minister or are you still an ordained minister or you used to be yeah still am yeah okay and you know at, at the same time as being a paranormal investigator and a psychic you right. also spent years studying um and researching theory like re um sorry religion theory so yeah. what yes. were you looking for and what did you find in all of this in all of your research well in in all of my research i would examine everything whether it was uh, you know, Christian theory or Buddhist theory or spiritualism or pagan theory, whatever it was, I wanted to say, okay, you claim to have the answer. And every religion does, every movement does, every spiritual thing does. So you have claimed to have the answer. What is that answer? Let's study it. Let's find out what it is. Let's distill it. Let's boil it down to this is supposed to work. Okay. And then let's take it and let's see if it works. And if it works, we keep it and we delve further. If it doesn't work, we throw it away. And you give it enough tries and enough situations in life that you see whether this actually um, helps, does anything, whether it works, whether it produces anything positive or not. And you give it plenty of opportunity over and over and over, regardless of what it is, whether it's, you know, the, the Bible or whether it's Scientology or whether it's a unity, whether, no matter what it is, you say, okay, Let's see if this works. Let's give this plenty of opportunity to work. And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work and you got to face it and you got to get rid of it and you got to go on down the road. So that was my modus operandi for all of this. And in all of this, I was looking for the truth. Everybody claimed to have the truth. Everybody claimed to have the corner on God. Everybody claimed to have the corner on healing or on manifesting prosperity and abundance and everything else. Okay, let's do it. 
and I have found very, 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 very little that worked. Out of everything. So of everything. what? Out of everything. So what? What did work for you? Well, what worked for me was the understanding that the paranormal realm is real, that it does communicate with us, that it does help us, maybe not in all the ways that we want when we want it, but it is there, it is real, it does help us, it does interact with us, and we have this very, very incomplete understanding of it. And what I tell people to do is like, look, we have to walk in what light that we're given and hope we get more. And that's not an excuse or a cop out. It's just the way this thing works. I don't know why. I wish it wasn't that way, but it apparently is. And the other side kind of plays peekaboo with us sometimes, me included. And sometimes you learn the lesson of why that is. And sometimes you don't. And I tell everybody, I tell all my clients, all my friends, family and everything. I say, look, go to the other side directly. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a cult. You don't need a church. You don't need a group. You don't need a movement go to this energy and say, okay, I know you're here. I know that we can have this interaction. I need help in my life. I need you to talk to me. I need you to guide me. I need you to give me something intuitive that will help me to be a better person, a healthy person, a prospered person, to live a happy life and to engage other people with that as well so that I can be a positive influence in their life as well. And then you shut up and you listen. We pray, we chant, we ask, we affirm, and we never shut up to get the answer. If I, if I ask you, hey, Christina, I need to know how to set up a, a microphone, a studio like that. And listen, you know, I was going down the road the other day and I had this hot dog and then I stopped and I, had, I was on my motorcycle. And if I do that, I'm never going to get your answer. I have to shut up and listen and go, okay, John, here's how you set this up. So this is what we have to do in real life. You know, we're always got the earbuds in, we're on the computer, we're on the tablet, we're on the video, we're on the cell phone, scrolling, looking at the latest cat video or whatever. Oh, cats. And what we have to do is we ask, and then we have to get quiet and we have to listen. And that takes turning off everything, unplugging from everything and listening, letting our intuition absorb what the other side has to tell us. They may tell us something that day, it may come in a week, it may come in a month, but we have to listen daily, make time to listen daily until we get that answer. And then we follow through to that and we go forward with that. John, I mean, Jack has a question. Thank you so much for the super chat. It says another great show and great guest, Christina. Please thank ask John. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. You know, you're the best. Oh, um, <laughs> Please ask John if he would or has worked on any military or government special access programs related to psychic abilities. Good question. I have not. Uh, I have worked with some police agencies, including the FBI, uh, but I have not worked with any military programs. And I don't think that I would uh, for the simple reason that I think too many, there's a potential for too many bad things to happen to people that work in military programs uh, from, from some of the things that have happened to some of the remote viewers and other people involved. And I would worry about that aspect of it. And I wouldn't want that type of um, control and manipulation over my life and over my gift. So I, I really wouldn't want to be involved with that. And as, as far as the work that I've done with law enforcement, with the FBI, um, that hadn't been incredibly satisfying either. It's been pretty frustrating, actually. And I had a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a, uh, oh, let me think of the name of the production company. When I was living in New York, uh, the production company that did psychic detectives on TV, maybe I'll think of their name here in a minute, but anyways, you can look them up on the internet. Uh, they call me and uh, we're, we're talking um, to me about doing an episode of Psychic Detectives or maybe a, a series of things with that. And they asked me if I had worked with law enforcement. And I said, well, in a limited capacity and nobody that I don't, I, I don't think they would come forward and want to work on the show or, you know, be on the show or whatever. So they said, if we can connect you with somebody that is willing to be on camera and to be on Psychic Detectives and, and work, would you do that? And I said, sure. 
But I said, let me ask you a question. You're calling me. And I said, I've watched psychic detectives. And I said, you've had some psychics on there that blew my hair back. I said, man, these guys were like, you're going to walk out here a hundred yards and you're going to find this guy hanging in a tree and you're going to hear a dog barking and all this and all that. And it happened. And I was like, look, you, you've got these guys. What are you calling me for? You know? And she said, well, she said, uh, it's, it's really kind of odd. She said, uh, police departments and things are, are kind of not willing to continue working with, with certain psychics or to engage with psychics or whatever. So we're kind of constantly refreshing the, the pool. I mm -hmm. said, well, why? I said, if somebody is that good, that accurate, and they're getting the results, why? And she said, well, the honest truth of the matter is there's a lot of police departments and a lot of cops that think, you know, this guy's coming in and usurping me and showing me up and makes me look like I'm not doing my job and it looks bad for me. And so that was one of the aspects of it. And then the other aspect was the religious thing, you know, oh, this, this guy must be the devil or whatever. He comes in and does this stuff. <laughs> so that was, that was my experience with that. It was, it was pretty frustrating. Uh, what have I done for the FBI zero cool? Um, I had uh, the FBI call me uh, back when I was uh, several years ago. Um, let's see, that was, that was when we'd moved here and the FBI called me and they wanted my assistance on this case. And so I said, okay, anybody on the planet can call and say they're with the FBI. I said, give me a callback number. And I will call that number. I will verify it. I'll research it, verify that it is the FBI. And then I'm going to call that number and ask for you. And then we'll talk. So he gave me a number. So I got the, uh, the FBI address and, and number and everything. And I called that number and said, uh, I need to speak with agent so-and-so. Is there an agent so-and-so there? Yes, there is. I said, okay. And my, you know, who's calling and why? And I said, well, he called me and I told him I'd call and verify this number. So sure enough, there's an agent so-and-so with the FBI. So there was this case that they asked me to utilize my psychic power zone. And I gave them several very specific things. And what was extremely frustrating was we had the occasion to talk again a little ways down the road. And I had given him this, uh, I had seen this, this highway number and I gave him this highway number and, um, so we were talking and I, and it seemed to be very integral to the case and that there would be some clues there. And I gave him directions down the highway, what to look for, where to turn into and, and all this type of thing. So we were talking and I said, listen, I said, did you, did you find that highway? Was there that highway number? And he said, Oh yeah, yeah, there was a, there was a highway with, with that exact number. I said, so what happened? Said, oh, we hadn't investigated it yet. like, <laughs> Okay, fine, whatever. And so that was that was basically the end of that. Beverly has a question. Thank you so much. You're so sweet. And it says, another great show, Christina. Great guest. Has Mr. Russell ever had any psychic communication with interdimensional beings or extraterrestrials? That's a oh, great Beverly, question. Good question. Yes. As a matter of fact, I have. <gasps> um, I have had experiences with nature spirits, what I would call nature spirits, uh, guardian angels, uh, other entities, beings that I don't know that we can even classify them. I don't even know that we can describe exactly what they are, but they've communicated uh, with me in, in very dramatic ways. And um, as far as communication with extraterrestrials, the only thing I can hang my hat on, uh, I haven't had any, you know, peace, light, here we come, Brother Russell, we come to love you. I haven't had any of that nonsense. But I have had an experience that blew my mind. Um, I was sitting out uh, at night and uh, watching the stars, and it was a clear night, beautiful night. And Venus was out, and over to the, uh, the east where Venus was uh, came this very bright, glowing, orange orb and i looked at it and i thought okay that's a plane because we live near an airport and i thought it was a plane coming in and uh <clears throat> excuse me it went on by and, and went around to the front of me and i looked at it and i said there's no engine noise there's no blinking lights there's no navigation lights there's absolutely nothing it's just this round glowing translucent orange orb and 
it dawned on me, I said, oh my God, this is a UFO. And I've seen UFOs before, but I had not seen this, this orange orb that a lot of people see. So now here it is. And it's down here really low, like where the, the little planes fly coming into the airport and all that. And it's going around to the north now. So I stood up and I said, psychically and verbally, I said, hey, if you can hear me, stop and reverse course a little bit. And the damn thing stops in midair, backs up slightly, and then in a split second time, it shoots from way down here up to where the big airliners fly when you see them going over at night. No sound, no noise, no sonic boom, no flames, no nothing, just boom. All of a sudden, there it is. And I'm like, holy cow. And then, boom, up into the stars in less than a second's time. No, no noise, no sonic boom, no nothing. And it just kind of meanders there a little bit and then boom off into the universe. And I'm like, holy friggin' cow. So I don't know whose they are or what it is, but to be, to have that dynamic of flight characteristics that breaks all our known laws of physics, no sonic boom, no, no physical manifestations of any time, no noise, no nothing. I, I was just gobsmacked. And, but the thing of it is, is to have that respond to me that way, but then just to shoot off and, and nothing since, no no explanation, no nothing. And uh, when, when I was on Singularity Lab with Michael Madaluni, Michael was like, well, maybe they're just kind of poking at you like, ha ha, see what we can do, see what we can do. Like, that may be it. It may be as simple as that. I don't know, but I haven't received any grand noble communication or, or anything like that. But uh, so that's that's the experience I've had. They they did hear and respond to what I sent out. So they are capable of doing that, even though they are physical objects. Uh, so, you know, who knows? And that's that's the rub of all this thing. We don't know. <laughs> you know, we wish we knew. And that's why we're pushing, you know, Congress and the military and science and everything else. I'm firmly convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that somebody in that cabal knows somebody has the answer and i'm firmly convinced of that so that's, well, that's why we have to keep pushing well hopefully they spill the beans rather soon because i mean time's running I out i know it is yeah absolutely it is and i have uh, oh let me real quick let me tell you about my roswell ufo experience i was in uh, i was in roswell in 1998 doing this thing called alien encounter 98 and uh, I got to see Stanton Friedman lecture in person, and I was there doing readings. And I was born in New Mexico, but I had never been there, never lived there. And uh, I thought, well, while I'm here, I got to go to the Roswell UFO Museum. So I go down early in the morning, and it wasn't open, so I'm looking in the windows. I'm standing right out on the sidewalk. And this lady comes down the sidewalk, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, she nods, says, hi, I'm, hi, how you doing? And she stops. And she said, uh, are, are you waiting for the UFO museum to open? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to get in. She said, your first time here? And I said, yeah, it is. She said, uh, you don't live in Roswell? And I said, no, no, I, said, I live in Texas. And I said, funny thing, I was born in New Mexico, but I've never lived in New Mexico, and this is my first time in Roswell. Oh, okay. What do you do? Well, I'm a psychic, and uh, I'm here with Alien Counter 98. I'm over there giving readings. She goes, well, you'll understand what I'm going to tell you then. I said, okay. So she said, when me and my brother were kids, we saw the craft fly over and crash. And she had my immediate undivided attention. And I said, okay. She said, we were outside playing and we saw it fly over at close range. And we knew it wasn't a weather balloon. It wasn't a blimp. It wasn't a helicopter. It wasn't a plane. It wasn't a bird. It wasn't a Superman. This was a UFO. We saw it plainly. We saw it clearly. And from the way that it maneuvered, we could tell that it was in trouble. And we saw it go on over. And we saw the effect of the crash, basically saw it crash off over in the distance. And I'm just gobsmacked. I'm like, holy cow. So we talk a little bit longer and I'm like, you know, geez, people like you that f literally physically saw this with your own eyes. Why aren't you coming forward? Why aren't you? Why don't I see you on interviews? And why aren't more people like this coming forward and, and telling people this? <clears throat> Excuse me. And she goes, well, 
She said, when this happened, and this is not the only lady to say this. If you research this, you hear this a lot. But she tells me personally, she said, when this happened, we had people show up that we presume some of them were government people. We presume some of them were military people. Some people showed up. We didn't know who the heck they were. And the, uh, the general party line went, if you or anyone in your family talks about this, is interviewed about this, mentions this, your bones are going to be found out in the desert. And I was like, damn. <laughs> and she said, you know, uh, we've got some pretty strong, pretty brave people around here that can't be intimidated or threatened or scared. But what about your family? What about your kids? You know, so even if you don't care, if you're like, well, bring it on, fine. But what about your family? What about your kids? And she said, we all had that threat experience. And then she stopped talking to me. And she looked up and down the street like this a few times. She goes, I've said too much. I've got to go. Sorry. And she went on down the street. So all these years later, that fear, that threat that was, was still with her. So that's one of the things I think that we continue to battle in this, um, you know, with, uh, with getting people to come forward and getting witnesses to come forward. And in the government's UFO report, they've admitted that they created the, uh, the make fun of you process if you report anything and now they're trying to correct that right so people can come forward and talk so that's been another aspect of it and so we have all these things to contend with but you know we are the disclosure we have to keep that pressure on we have to do that and i cannot agree more with you on that let's change gears a little bit and sure. i want to talk about one of your books called um, a knock in the attic. And you mentioned yeah. that you are a wounded healer in that book, meaning that you're able to heal others, but not yourself, given the fact that you walk with the cane and have some health issues. Why do you think, issues, yeah. but why do you think that is? Why do you think that you're able to heal others and not yourself? I have no clue. <laughs> I wish I did, but I have no clue. The, uh, the concept of the wounded healer goes back a long way, and it's that people are giving healing abilities that can help other people, but they can't help themselves. And there's various explanations for the wounded healer thing. And, and I only use that because it makes as much sense as anything else, I guess. But um, I have had a tremendous amount of serious health issues ever since I was a kid, and I have never been able to overcome them. Uh, and I use spiritual healing techniques for myself. And that's the only thing that's kept me going that and the grace of the guys on the other side. But as far as an actual complete healing for all of my physical issues, I've never experienced that. And at the same time, I have been able to physically heal other people, uh, from small things. Uh, there was a, um, a dear friend of mine. I write about him in the book. Uh, we, we used to go to the uh, to bar together. We were good drinking buddies. And this bar that we went to, it was a Chili's restaurant. And most of the kids that worked there were working their way through college. And so we knew all the waiters and waitresses and were good friends with them. So uh, this one gal came in one night and uh, she came over and we were sitting at the bar and she came over and kind of flopped down on the bar. And she goes, my God, look at my lip. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she had this, this fever blister, this cold sore. It was like the size of a goiter up here on her lip. I mean, she goes, look at me. I'm a monster. It's hideous. And we were kind of laughing and trying not to laugh at it. It was grotesque. It was huge. It was just monstrous. And uh, she said, my God, she said, can you see this thing? And I, we were laughing. I said, yeah. And I said, listen, I said, uh, let, let me try something. Do you care if I try something? She goes, what? And I said, oh, an old Indian trick I learned. I said, let me, let me do this thing, see what happens. She goes, okay, whatever. So right here at the bar in front of this crowded restaurant, crowded bar, I put this energy into my finger and I hold my finger about half an inch away from this fever blister. And I send this energy into it. And, you know, if you have a really bad cold sore, really bad fever blister, even if you take medicine as soon as it starts, you're looking at a week or two before it's even semi-normal again. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I do this and, and I stop and I go, do you feel anything? She goes, yeah, it, it tingled and felt kind of funny. Like it, it had like this weird energy or something. And what'd you do? I said, oh, it's an old Indian trick. Don't worry. So the very next day we're in there drinking again. Here she comes, runs over to the bar, flops down on the bar again and goes, my God, look at my lip. 
It was absolutely, totally, completely smooth, completely healed, not a blemish, not a speck, nothing on it. So being able to do that in a very small way and then uh, in larger ways, uh, there was a guy that uh, when I was without a car for a while and used to ride the bus, this guy had back surgery. I've never known anybody get better from back surgery. And he had a body brace and was on a cane and he was way worse shape than I was. And we kind of struck up a friendship. And when, he did, when he'd get on the bus, he'd come sit down in the seat in front of me and we'd talk till the bus started up and he'd turn around. And I'd take my hands and I'd generate energy and I'd put them down to his back, lower back. And I'd send this energy through the seat into his back. And I'd do this for as long as I could for each bus ride that we we were on. And within a week's time, he showed up one day and the bus pulled over. And the bus driver went, look at you. What in the world's going on? He, he was still using the cane, but he wasn't leaning on it very hard. Didn't have his body brace no more. And he got on. He said, man, I don't know. But he said, my doctor said he's never seen anybody heal from this type of surgery this fast. He's just shocked. He's astonished. He has no explanation for it. So, so physical healing using spiritual techniques is possible. And like I say, you can do it for small things. You can do it for large things. But uh, why am I stuck like this? I don't know. <laughs> but, but I'm glad I can help other people when I can. Well, I know a sadhu from Varanasi in India who who is very the same to you. You know, he heals people and it's insane. But sometimes, you know, uh, he gets sick and ill with the exact same afflictions that he has healed someone from. So when I asked him about it, because I, I have I had this question to him and why he never heals himself after he heals someone else and gets the affliction. Right. He tells me it's all because uh, it's all about karma, compassion, and building up positive energies for the next life. So maybe that's what you're maybe unconsciously doing. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> we don't know. We don't. You we really don't know. Don't. We just don't know. You know, it would be it would be great if we did, but we don't. And like I said, the other side plays peekaboo with us about these things. We get little hints. We get little teases here and there, and. Uh, we don't always get the complete answers we want. Sometimes we don't get any answer that we want. So it's uh, that's where you learn to walk by faith. You have to. I would like to say, hola to Miguel. How are you doing from Argentina? It is so uh, good that this is reaching all parts of the earth. Hola, My amigo. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I'm. I don't want to say too much because I will butcher my Spanish. My my mom hates it. She hates Me when too. I speak Spanglish <laughs> to her on the phone. I have to tell you something real funny, real quick about that. We have this guy. Um, let's see the uh, uh, the famous flamenco guitarist. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but we had his star pupil come and and do a performance of uh, of uh, classical guitar, flamenco guitar, whatever it was, and the. Uh, this was in Texas. And so one of the, the gals in the audience decided afterward that he was taking pictures, doing autographs and everything. And so she decided she was going to go up and in Spanish, tell him how great the concert was and what a great maestro he was on the guitar and all this. And she was rattling away, talking to him and, and he looked real confused and he looked over at the interpreter and he looked back to her and he looked over at the interpreter and the interpreter goes, Blah 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 blah. Tex Mex. Blah 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 blah. And he goes, oh, <laughs> it's like wasn't anything close to Castilian Spanish, you know? It was like he could he could pick out maybe every fifth word she said. So it's <laughs> kind of funny. Oh my gosh, it's it, it's it's amazing how the language works, and you know. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even know what to say because my, my mom, she calls me guapa a lot, which means beautiful. So she's like, oh yeah, guapa, like, don't be talking to me like this with her really thick accent. I'm like, oh my gosh, mom, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, please love me and make, make me breakfast. Oh, I, love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And, and it's funny you say that because the other side kind of talks to us in a way that we have to learn. We have to get that language because they speak to us sometimes in signs symbols, aromas, sounds, uh, intuitions, coincidences that we think are coincidences and they're not. So we have to learn that language and we have to learn how to interpret that. And uh, we have to learn how to speak. We have to, we have to. Um, there's something that you mentioned that I don't, that I want you to talk about and that's cloud busting. What is that? Uh, 
this is an old psychic technique that goes back a long, long, long ways. And I was thinking about it the other day and I thought, boy, you don't hear hardly anybody talk about this anymore to cloud bust. You sit outside on a nice day where it's not real windy, not real stormy. You want mostly blue skies, maybe a little tiny white puffy cloud here and there. And you sit there and you visualize from your third eye region, this ray going out from you to this cloud. And you visualize this ray disintegrating, disrupting this cloud and breaking it up. And in your mind, you say to this cloud, thank you for disintegrating. Thank you for breaking up. Thank you for accepting this energy and for dissipating. And you can do this if you really get into it, if you really focus, if you're really serious about it, you really try it, that cloud is just going to just disappear. I did this one time. Uh, I was sitting out in a state park here and overlooking the river, this wide river, and these little clouds were drifting by. And so I hadn't practiced this in a long time. So I did this and I focused on this one little cloud and it just, just nothing, just, just disappeared, just evaporated. And I had sent such strong energy to that region of the sky that remained there for a little while that every cloud that came by, as soon as they hit that spot, they would just vanish. They would just disintegrate. About two or three more clouds came by and just poof, would I, without me even thinking about it, without me even sending anything else out. So that's cloud busting. And what I would like to, um, to ask people to think about is if we can do that to a cloud, what if we all get together and think about the coronavirus and we send this energy out there and visualize these little viruses floating about and in people's bodies and in the air and here and there and the other, and we send to them this energy just to evaporate them, just to get rid of them, just to demolish them. So that, that's the message I want to give people to think about that. We can do so much. I mean, I have done telekinesis. I have physically affected objects and I've had witnesses to this and I've taught people how to do this. Um, affected objects with psychic power. So if we can affect physical objects with psychic power, can't we affect these little viruses and things? If we can bust clouds with psychic power, can't we affect all these little, you know, little things and disintegrate them as well. So that's the message I'm trying to get people to accept and think about now is to think, Hey, let's do this. You know, let's work together. Everybody visualize this daily and work on this. And if we do this in a unified concerted manner, we might accomplish something here. Mm, I like it. I'm all for it. Look, yeah. I, anything to put life back to normal. I'll take it. Yes. I'll yes, do absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Dylan has a question. Thank you so much for the super chat. It says, hi, John, have you ever seen the room you're in with your eyes closed? If yes. so, <laughs> what did solid objects look like? Or have you ever seen a shadow mandala? It's really funny that you asked that Dylan, because yes to all of the above. Uh, I have seen the room I'm in with my eyes closed. The solid objects uh, continue to look solid, but maybe a little translucent maybe a little vibration or energy around them. And uh, what I would deem a shadow mandala, uh, I saw with my eyes closed, the other side gave me this image. I'm not gonna go into the specifics of it, but the, because I think it's, it's mostly specifically for me. But the other side gave me this image when I, my eyes were closed and it was so strong, it, was, it looked like I had my eyes open and was seeing it in the room. And it was a very, very detailed, very graphic, very specific image and nothing that I had ever seen before. And they showed me an application for this for me. And it was so specific and so dramatic that I got up and I started searching the web because as familiar as I am with all these signs and symbols and amulets and talismans and all these other things, I have never, ever, ever seen anything like this that I was shown. And I'll be doggone if I didn't find it. And I was like, wow. Okay. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so I have, yes. Jeez. I just want to mention that we have about five more minutes for this live cast. We will be doing another 15 minute segment for the Patreon supporters. Yes. So, um, 
keep your eyes open for that. I'm really excited. And honestly, jo- I just want I just want to keep you in my pocket. I just want to keep you right there oh, and ask you heart. like infinity amount of questions. Oh, bless your heart. Hey, I'm I'm here as long as you need me. <laughs> and well, I can I can always come back. Oh, absolutely. You're already you're already written in in my white book of like All good right. people. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. <laughs> so, I we we have about 5 minutes, but maybe if if we finish a little bit early, that's fine. Cause I, I want to end with this question. Okay. And th- the question is for those that want to practice being a psychic, what advice do you have for them? Don't do it unless you have a real gift and a real calling. Um, the, uh, I, I knew a, a preacher one time, an old preacher, the only guy that I ever thought had any real sense. And he used to tell people, he said, if, if you think Christ calls you to preach, if you can do anything else on the planet but that, do it. Don't do it. <laughs> and, and I think the, um, you know, the problem we have nowadays, everybody's a psychic. Uh, they get a, a, a deck of tarot cards and they read the little booklet that comes with it. And I'm a tarot reader. Or they read a book on psychic power and, oh, I'm a psychic. Um, they read about the, the history or a book or two of spiritual, oh, I'm a medium and it it doesn't work that way. You know, it's like, um, I always wanted to be a distance runner and I wanted to run a marathon. Now I have ankylosing spondylitis since I'm young, which is a form of arthritis that attacks the bones, the joints, the muscles, and the interior organs, the internal organs. I have asthma since I was a kid. I have COPD since I was in my teens. I have all these problems that are like, no, John, you're not going to be a runner. Runners don't have these issues. Runners are healthy people. So no matter how I trained or what I did or what I wanted to do, I'm not a marathoner. Okay. So you have to realize that you have to be given certain gifts. There has to be certain conditions. There has to be certain things requisite for things to work. You can want to be a psychic. Maybe you're never going to be a psychic. You can want to develop more power, uh, more gifts, whatever. Maybe you've plateaued and you're not going to get any more. Maybe that's all you get. So, you know, very few people that are, are doing things or trying to a lot of people that advertise themselves as readers or psychics or this, that, and the other, they're not. They've read a few books or they've memorized some of the little booklet that came with the tarot deck and they throw that out for everything and, and that's what they do. So, you know, if you have a genuine gift, you will know it. It'll work. You know, people will tell you, man, those things you predicted for me, they happened. They came true. And unless that happens, guess what? You ain't there. You ain't got it. Uh, so if it's there, if it's real, you'll know it. And then you'll find ways to develop that and to grow with it. And it's very serious. Uh, it's a calling. It's a, it's a gift and it's a blessed thing. But listen, you're leading people's lives. You're, you've got people's lives in your hands and they depend upon you for real and accurate answers and things that are going to improve their lives and help their lives. And the only reason I've stayed in, in business and done this for 50 years is because my clients give me that feedback that, you know, what you predicted happened and it helped me, what you told me happened and it helped me, your insights were accurate and they helped me. What you told me to do made my life better. And if you can't do that, you know, give it up and do something else. Take up welding or candy making or whatever. But (laughs) we got enough problems in the field as it is, you know, stay out of it unless you got a real calling. Oh my gosh, Sean, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Where can people find your books? I know we talked about one and we didn't talk about the other and I wish we did, but we don't have time, but please tell us what your books are and where can they be found? Yeah. Uh, Go to my website, johnrussell.net. There's links to the books there, but you can also look at each book's individual site, which is writingwithghosts.net or anockintheattic.net. And they're available at Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Amazon, Target and Walmart carry them online. All the mom and pop bookstores have them. And the one thing that I'm really proud about, about these books, is that I have had a n- numerous people tell me, John, I've read things about religion, the paranormal, psychic realm, supernatural, all of my life. I have never, ever read books like these before. So that makes me feel good. You're going to get an adventure that's unlike any other. 
Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you for everyone that's in the live chat, everyone yeah. that drops super chats. Please make sure to share this show because we definitely hit topics that aren't really common to talk about. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I also want to thank all my Patreon supporters. Have a great weekend. And remember, keep your eyes on, on the skies. The skies. <laughs>